Okay, shall we continue? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. All right. Great. All right. Okay, so let's take a moment to set our motivation just to reinforce what we did this morning. To remind ourselves why we're here. Having found a method to attaining the enlightened state of a Buddha and having all the freedoms and opportunities to practice the Dharma. Let's not use it only for our own benefit but for the benefit of all sentient beings. who are senselessly and endlessly suffering right now. They're generating not just the aspiration, but the determination to attain the fully enlightened state of a Buddha for the welfare of all sentient beings. And with this motivation, we'll now listen to the teachings on the 12 links and reflect, analyze them and meditate on them. Okay. Well, first of all, are there any questions? Let me check the, cha the chat. Oh yes, there is a question. Oh, okay. That's not a question. Okay. Um, any questions? Yes, please. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I was wondering about the... Uh, you, you said that there is like a, an a habitual aspect to the imprints and the uh -huh. karmic aspect, which is the... Uh, which what generates the uh, experiences and projections towards other rivers. So I was wondering, are they the same, are they the different aspects of the same imprint or are there two different, different. imprints that arise from a single action? Mm, good question. Tom, right? Yeah, I guess I saw your name there. Um, that's a good question. You see, it's, I, I, I ask myself the same question because this is usually not really discussed. I mean, no one really discussed. No one talks about this as in um, there are more imprints. I mean, it's not just that. There are more imprints that I mentioned. For instance, the imprints that are responsible for us perceiving all things or having the appearance of things as if existing from their own sides. That's the kind of imprint we hear about, an imprint from the misapprehension of reality that's left by that mind, right? So that is that kind of imprint. And then there are imprints left by anger, for instance. So they talk about imprints left by anger. Um, Lama Tsongkhapa talks about them um, when he says, a person who's removed anger, so an arhat who's totally removed anger, they still have the imprints of anger, which accounts for them sometimes uh, to talk in a way that seems angry. They may respond angry, not angrily, that's wrong because there's no anger. So they're not motivated by anger, but they may 
apply a language that's slightly harsh and, and kind of direct and they're maybe loud or something. That is the imprints that were left by the anger. And in that case, it's kind of a habit. It kind of seems to imply a habit. So when, whereas in the past, because they may have had an anger problem, so they would always react angrily. Now there's no anger to motivate them, but they still act on that anger, right? So that's the case of anger. And then attachment, Lama Tsongkhapa also mentions attachment. Even if you've removed attachment, um, out of attachment, for instance, we sometimes can't sit still. We jump around and we're not able to... Well, we jump around like monkeys, for instance. So Lama Tsongkhapa says that there are those who removed attachment. So now they're no longer motivated by attachment. However, they may still move around like a, like a monkey. So they're an ahad. They've, they have single pointed uh, concentration. But here it's the habitual aspect, uh, the habitual kind of imprint of the attachment that accounts for them jumping around like a monkey. But on the other hand, that is definitely a cognitive obscuration. That is also the imprints left by the um, the imprints left by anger, by attachment, by um, by ignorance, with ignorance just having this aspect of the appearance of inherent existence. We could say that that's also a habitual aspect, the habitual aspect of uh, of uh, the misapprehension of reality, like perceiving things as inherently existent, that leaves an imprint. And that has this function of habitually still having the appearance of, of, of inherent existence. So we're habituated to seeing things that way. <coughs> and as long as we have that imprint, that habits remains with us. But all these imprints, imprints left by any of the afflictive emotions are called cognitive obscurations. So they have a further function besides this habitual function, which in the case of ignorance is the appearance. Um, and in the case of anger, it is what is just explained and so forth. On top of that, they obscure the mind. So it seems you have a single imprint that has two functions. It obscures the mind, plus it has the function uh, of leaving a habit. So then I was thinking, well, if that's the case, why not have, why do you need imprints? Because it sounds, the way they describe imprints, it's like these, these are different imprints. But make me think, well, there's a residue left on the mind. Why different residues? It's not like you can count them like little seeds. I mean, that's just a, an analogy that is used for better understanding. But really, something is left of them on the mind and it has this function and that function. So to me, and this is just my personal way of looking at it I've asked my teachers about it and they their response was we don't know but it would make sense that a, a single imprint like we wouldn't differentiate uh it would have these different functions so all they said was it would make sense but we don't know so I haven't really come any uh, come across anyone who could answer this um in terms of someone else but since in terms of the, uh, the, the imprints of the obscurations, since there are two functions, well, the function of obscuration and the function of habit, I believe you, you can probably talk of different functions such as also karmic, right? It wouldn't make sense to me, but I don't know for sure. Good question. <laughs> Interesting question because I've wondered myself, yeah. Okay, anyone else? Uh, hello, Yoshila. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, uh, hello. Yes, I, I wrote it. Uh, I'm taking the example of the butterfly's uh, wing flapping. Now, ah, yes. most, most flappings have no consequential results more than just a little bit of air moving. Okay. And I'm asking is, is it the same? Can we say it's the same with our mind that most of our mind, um, you know, mental actions have little consequences? Okay. Well, first of all, I would argue with the flapping of the bird's wings, we don't observe great consequences, do we? Because what we do is we're not very patient to, to follow this, you know, we see the bird 
moving its wings and then we're distracted we're looking at something else we're not following the movement of these like what does it affect around them so it moves atoms in the oh, we'll still don't have the, the capacity to actually analyze that um, so actually what what happens when the bat moves its wings well atoms are moved and they in turn move something else and they in turn move something else and we don't know we can have great uh, consequences. It can, well, there's this saying, I don't know how literal it can be taken, but if a smetterling, uh, smetterling, that's a German word, if a butterfly moves its wings, that can cause a, in one part of the world, it can cause a, a hurricane somewhere else, right? We've all heard this. Now, whether that's true or not, I, we need to, uh, you know, talk to, to, to an, um, an expert, but I mean, not even causing a hurricane, but causing something, because there's movements. They they move atoms in the in the sky. Like they, they move atoms in the sky. They move something else. They move something else. And it could actually affect something not as major as a hurricane, but something else. Right? We just don't have the capacity. We don't have the patience to follow that. But even if we had the patience, we right now don't have the 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 scientific kind of tools to follow exactly its consequences. So since everything is interconnected, I mean. For instance, if you put a tiny bit of poison into a river, right, we get a sense, ah, it doesn't really affect anything. But who knows, maybe, you know, a whole bunch of fish die and that affects other living beings and that affects, you know, these ripple effects of all our actions. It doesn't always have to be a disaster or something that is terribly obvious to us, but everything is interconnected. And so therefore, there's this ripple effect and it has an effect on so many things. So, for instance, we may think, oh, a little seed, it doesn't have much of a, of, a, of a result. There's a tiny seed that falls off a tree. Okay, so it falls into the ground and it just lies there for ages. And we feel, well, it doesn't have great consequences. When one day it starts sprouting and then one day it grows into a seedling, it grows into a plant, it grows into a tree, into this huge tree that has lots and lots of fruits, which again, and they create an entire forest but we're just not around to, to observe this long enough, you see? So the thing is, it seems right away very little, very little consequence, right? The, the, the flapping of the bird's wings, for instance. Um, and the seed is a good example. That's why a karmic seed is called a karmic seed, where just a tiny action can, in fact, over time, have great consequences, such as powerful experiences. Does that make sense, Eduard? Yes, but wouldn't then, well, then, but not, sorry, but not any tiny action. The thing yeah. that we don't know which one. Yes, yes. But among the, 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 the very large number of tiny yeah. mental actions or seeds or, yes, yes, or yes, butterfly yes. flappings, yes. only yeah. we yes. can logically infer that yes. only a very tiny minority lead to consequential results we just don't know which ones yes okay so the the neutral ones i totally agree neutral ones so the ones that were not induced for instance by great attachment great anger uh, so really we need to watch the mind like for instance we just have neutral thoughts they're not virtues or non-virtues that is harmful or non-harmful just ordinary thoughts and I think most ordinary people I mean there's some people who are always planning to harm others and they're always out to take a revenge etc but those are probably a minority so I, I guess I would agree with you like as an ordinary person just going about their their personal affairs without great love and compassion for others but also without great negative kind of emotions yeah most of their actions are neutral and they result in something neutral and actually the fact that they're not harming anyone have no intention to harm anyone that fact again is something virtuous so if they've they, they're more likely to have a higher rebirth um, in terms of not harming others so this fact i mean actually it's kind of described in the very simple way when we say um, a lot of non-virtue, like a, a very powerful virtuous action leads to very powerful rebirth and a very powerful negative action leads to that. But there are some descriptions as well when they say like many little, there, there's for instance this, ex this explanation that many uh, 
throwing commas, no, sorry, completing commas. So commas that are not as powerful that usually ordinarily give rise to just daily experiences when they they can actually add up and lead to a throwing birth so many of these tiny ones can actually cause that because otherwise uh, if someone never accumulates a lot of great virtuous actions well where do they accumulate when do they accumulate the karma um to be reborn again but on the other hand, you could argue not harming others, living a life without harming others, even though that's maybe not motivated by this strong love and compassion, but that itself is actually a greatly powerful action. So then again, it is, it doesn't, it seems insignificant to us, but the fact that they don't harm others, that they're always truthful um, and they, they don't insult others, the love and compassion that we associate with strong love and compassion may not be obviously there, but it's still a very powerful action. So powerful and not powerful doesn't necessarily mean obvious to us. Doesn't mean necessarily mean obvious. They may just seem so ordinary, but we don't know what's going on in their mind, right? But I agree with you. If just we do on a daily basis, there are a lot of neutral actions and possibly the majority of our actions are neutral actions, right? Unless there's anger and jealousy kind of popping in and they do pop in and then of course they become non-virtuous actually actions that are just motivated by attachment they don't have to be negative just attachment it can be virtuous out of attachment we can um, do virtuous i mean not out of attachment itself but attachment can induce love can actually lead to love we we attach to a person and then we generate the wish for them to be happy. That is love. So it's like we have attachment for them, but at certain moments in time, we can feel love for them. And then out of this love, we do virtuous actions, but it's still a samsaric action because the attachment is involved. Okay. So it's karma. The moment we start talking about its details, it becomes extremely complicated because it is very complicated. And only a Buddha is said to understand all its um, details. But that is also true for a seed and a tree, right? Very superficially, we can say, oh, it's just a good old seed and it gives rise to a good old tree. But then analyze its atoms and which exact part of the seed give rise to this green leaf that's exactly 30 centimeter long or whatever, right? What exactly? And it becomes extremely complicated really difficult so cause and effect whether it's the law of cause and effect which is called the law of karma or law of cause of effect when it comes to external flowers etc in nature in its detailed forms it's very sophisticated and very complicated does that help edward thank you yes you're welcome all right uh then that's okay you also wrote the example of the butterflies that's your question right that's been answered about the ed, you're taking the example of the butterfly's wing flapping right okay then yes. sh shabbat shalom jonathan did jonathan oh hi jonathan next to the flower that's you right next to the green flower okay great jonathan okay shabbat shalom and thank you my question is about habits and caricature and the difference between them a table contains water therefore shrinks and changes by water and some isn't that a mind like everything with water a caricature oh sorry uh, jonathan i have to ask you what do you mean can you unmute your microphone and explain your question again I'm not sure i understand it i cannot can you hear me yes now i can hear you mm-hmm Thank you. Shabbat okay. shalom. Shabbat uh, shalom. My question is, I, I feel, okay, I don't know, but I feel that everything with water contains some kind of mind. Ah. And this includes a table in my mind. Ah, you believe that everything that has water in it, the element of water, yeah, has mind, has a mind, okay? Yeah. Yeah, what makes you believe that? I'm a carpenter. That? You're a carpenter. I'm a carpenter. Ah, okay. Ah, interesting. Okay. So yeah, you work with wood. It's got its own personality kind of, right? Uh, yeah. Wood. That is a very interesting idea that you bring this up. 
strictly speaking, from a Buddhist point of view, um, it is said that, oh, what, I did something wrong here. Okay. It, it is said that actually they're animate objects and inanimate objects. All right. And they say, for instance, that trees are inanimate objects, plants are inanimate objects, water is inanimate. But I don't know, in particular, when it comes to plants and trees. I don't know, because this question has come up all the time. Westerners in particular, Tibetans are like, yeah, they're inanimate, no problem. Of course, they sometimes talk about trees having living beings live in them. Of course, we know animals live in trees and there's said to be other animals we cannot perceive or other living beings living in, in trees that we cannot perceive, but that's a whole different matter. Um, but the tree itself, is it a sentient being? Does it have a mind? Okay, does it have a mind? Can it become enlightened? Is there a tree that has Buddha nature and can meditate and eventually is reborn, etc.? Now, that is difficult. And I remember, actually, it was Gila. She once sent me, the question was asked in class, and someone argued, oh, the tree's got feeling because it, it grows away from something that harms it. It bleeds when someone uh, cuts it and so forth. And uh, I didn't know what to say because... The argument was powerful, but in the scriptures it says this. And then Gila, she she sent or she gave me a book, and at the, by His Holiness, and the very end, His Holiness was asked that question, and someone asked again, "Are trees sentient?" And His Holiness said, um, "Well, actually, it says no." And there must have been a plant in the room, a tree, a plant in the room. And his holiness said, well, and he pointed at a tree or a, at a plant. And he said, but whether that plant is a sentient being or not, I don't know. So it's almost like, well, maybe there are some trees and there are some plants that are sentient beings. So that's just plants. Okay. Now, those are, well, they're living organisms different to I mean, different to water and different to stones, etc., as in that they grow and they have certain, here's one argument. I don't know. Now, when it comes to what is interesting, so that is the argument for it, but the argument against it is this. That's, it's, it's a, so bear with me because it's a little difficult. When it comes to our sense of reality with regard to inherent existence, this is a very interesting phenomenon because not only do we have a sense, not only do we have a sense that there's something intrinsic, there's something within the object that makes it wood, there's something in the object that makes it water, etc. That's on the deepest level. Okay, and we need to check whether there is that or not. So that's totally up to us. The Buddha just claims this and it's up to us to research it further. Okay, of course, the only reason we're doing this that the Buddha says we suffer because of not understanding it. That's the only incentive we should have to investigate it further. But having said that, this basic misapprehension gives rise to other types of misapprehensions that we start seeing, we start seeing almost a personality in other things. So for instance, if you have a car that behaves in a certain way, I mean, people have a sense that their car has a character, almost like, I mean, I remember my, my mom always gave her car a name. She started off with this little beetle and it was always called Julius. I don't know where she came up with this name, but she would always say, I'm going to take Julius now to go drive off. And we almost like as kids, we thought of our car as being a part of the family, right? And it was kind of like, sometimes it would start and sometimes it wouldn't. So it was like a kind of stubborn kind of part of the family, whatever. And I'm reminded of, of cartoons, you know, in cartoons, when cupboards can talk and walk and cars have faces and in cartoons, a lot of, a lot of cartoons that take on a personality. And to me, our house for the longest time, I remember had a character. It was protecting me. It took on a character. It had a self and I remember this with a lot of objects, the more attached I was to something, and I'm not trying saying you're having attachment here, I'm just saying in my case, yes, it seemed like when there was something, it was mine, 
it took on its own character. And just remembering this, at some point I wondered why in Buddhism, in particular in the Prasangika school, they talk of the selflessness of a computer, as if I were to perceive a self that doesn't exist. Why say selflessness? They usually say no inherent existence. Here it's very specifically that I perceive this laptop I'm using right now to be inherently existent. So its emptiness is the lack of inherent existence or any other object, right? I mean, even with this, I'll introduce you to someone. Leora asked me to do it for a while. I haven't done it for a while. This is my penguin. It's always next to me. Kitty Sencha Rinpoche gave that to me. When Kitty Sencha Rinpoche went to the Antarctic or somewhere, he, Rinpoche was also in Israel, so <laughs> you have a connection to Rinpoche, actually. When he went there, when he came back, he gave lots of gifts to people, and I got this penguin, and it's here right next to me. So to me, it's got a character <laughs> to me. I mean, it looks a bit like an, well, it looks like a sentient being. So it definitely has a character. It's got a shawl and everything. So the thing is, what I'm trying to say is um, we have a sense, I mean, I'm not talking about stuffed animals, but I'm talking in general, things seem to have a character. And I'm wondering whether that's why in Buddhism yourself, you talk about no self, of a of a car, no self of a of a um, of a house and so forth, because we have the sense that things have a character, have a personality. The moment we believe them to be inherently existent, there's something within them that we identify in other humans as well. But in other humans, there's no I. For instance, in human beings, there is no no inherent I. There's no self. There's only a labeled self. Yes, there's a label, there's a conventional self. With regard to um, other objects, we may perceive of them, when we see, let's say, first other human beings, more than an imputed self, we perceive there to be a true self, an inherent self. Likewise, we do this with inanimate objects, I believe. And I think that's where it could come from when we become very familiar with an object, we see similarities and there are. I mean, water has properties that are similar to humans. Definitely, there are certain properties. Um, however, I'm not sure they have a mind such that can get angry, a mind that is, you know, I, I, I don't think they have that. I don't think so. But we still perceive them as we habitually perceive other living beings but maybe it has a mind maybe it has maybe it is actually sentient that's why i can't answer this question but my point is i believe we we perceive something inherent like almost a personality in everything around us and that seems to be inherent in objects and that's where we go wrong does that make sense? I mean, all I was trying to say is why we say selflessness of things, because we see a self, I think, not just in other people, but also in other phenomena, in inanimate objects. And I'm not talking about a conventional self. I'm talking about an exaggerated self. Does that make sense? Okay. Anyway, I hope that answered your question. And in the end, I couldn't answer your question. I don't know whether it's sentient. I believe it's not, but I don't know. Okay. All right, next question. All right, so I've used, Kumpinda says, Venerable Kumpin says, uh, I use the words imprint and seeds interchangeably. <sighs> okay, yes, I did. I did. I used the word, well, I didn't actually. I used karmic seed and karmic imprint interchangeably. Okay, there is a bit of a difference uh, in terms of just seed and just imprint. This is where it gets slightly more complicated. Um, seed, the word seed, when it's referred to the mind, when it's referred to something mental, it is used in two ways. One way is the way I used it until now, up to now, which is a karmic seed. Why karmic seed? Why do I not? I can use the word imprint. That's fine. But when I use the word karmic seed, I'm stressing the fact that it has a potency. It has a potential to give rise to an experience when the right causes and conditions come together. 
as opposed to when I use the word karmic imprints, I'm using that from the point of view of being left behind like an imprint. So when I use the word karmic imprint, it's more from the point of view of its cause. When I use the word karmic seed, it's more from the point of view of what it gives rise to as having a potential and giving rise to an experience. So therefore the word seed is used to explain potential. Of course, in its traditional sense, when you have a plant and a seed, a seed has the potential to give rise um, to a flower. For instance, when we talk about um, the male semen, again, semen is the same as in like a seed. It has a potential to give rise to a child. Um, and then there's another way where you use it in Buddhism when it's referred to something mental, you refer to a seed. For instance, right now I have no anger. I have no anger. I'm not angry. But I have the seed of anger. Here I'm not talking about the karmic seed. I'm not talking about the habit either. Like a, a seed or a karmic imprint or an imprint that is left on the mind. I'm talking about the fact that although my anger is not there, I have the potential to get angry again. And this potential is called a seat. This potential is just another way of saying, well, the fact that I have self-grasping, well, first of all, I have the basic misapprehension of reality and therefore self-cherishing or self-centeredness. Therefore, I also have, and so labeled on the basis of the presence of self-centeredness and the fact that my anger is not here right now, I label, I have the potential to get angry. I have the seat of anger, right? It's really just labeled on the fact that I have all the causes to get angry, which means I have the self-centered attitude and the misapprehension of reality. Plus, I have the habits left by anger anyway. So all these because I have those, therefore I have the potential to get angry. And therefore I say I have the seed to get angry. That is not the seed that is left on the mind that is always there. Because the moment I have anger, then I don't say I have the potential to get angry because I am angry. I have the potential to get angry again in the future, but right now I am angry. So this what, what was previously a potential has now become the anger, right? Just like with the seed, a seed that has grown into a plant. When I had the seed, I was talking about the potential to give rise to the plant. Once I have the plant, I no longer talk about the seed having the potential of giving rise to the plant because the, the, the seed is no longer there. It's already grown into the plant. So likewise, right now I'm not angry. Let's say I get angry in an hour. So right now I have the seed to get angry because right now my mind has the potential to give rise to that anger. And then once the anger is there, I say this, this seed that I had early on to give rise to the anger, well, now that's no longer there because its causes and conditions are no longer, I mean, the causes and conditions of that moment, that self-grasping, that self-cherishing, that has moved on changed into new self-cherishing, new self-centeredness. So it has already given rise to the anger. Therefore, I say the seed that was earlier there to give rise, the potential to give earlier rise, that was there earlier to give rise to the anger now, well, that seed is no longer there because now there's the anger. There's seeds for new anger, but that's a different situation. Does that make sense, Kumbay? It's a little complicated. So we, we say like the seed gives rise to the anger. The seed, the potential for the anger, that gives rise to the anger. But we're not talking about some potential somewhere floating in the sky. We're talking about the causes and conditions now to give rise to my anger tomorrow. The causes and conditions. What are the causes and conditions for my anger tomorrow? that exists now, it's my, my ignorance, it's my, um, my self-centeredness as one example of these causes and conditions. Because they're there right now, they have the potential to give rise to the anger tomorrow. So the potential lies with them. And so there is a potential, there is a potential. And that potential 
it lies with them. It depends on them, I should say. It depends on them. They are not that potential, but um, it depends on them. And that potential then, that becomes the anger tomorrow. I have the potential to become angry because of the factors there. And then that turns into the anger. Just as the potential that a seed has, well, that transforms and becomes the actual seed. Does that make sense? Kumbin, go ahead. And where does the imprint fit into that picture? Okay, so the imprint is always present. The imprint is there the whole time, right? When we say the, it depends on which imprint, usually the word seed, that is an imprint, is called a karmic seed, okay? So now that, until it ripens, until it ripens, it's there in the form of a seed, but that seed does not become the experience. It does not turn into the experience because the experience is not, it's, 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 a, it's a situation, right? It's a situation that arises, um, but it's the seed continues. Actually, this, the karmic seed continues in the form of an imprint. It continues to be an imprint, but this karma has now ripened and this karmic seed has not become has not become the experience. It, it just has given rise to the experience. So there's a difference. Um, a karmic, uh, an imprint just gives rise to something, whereas a seed, such as the seed of anger that I described earlier, that becomes the anger, okay? So it, a, seed can, um, a, a seed can actually transform into a mind, but an imprint that is a seed, that does not become a mind. That's a little bit complicated. It's a little bit complicated, that explanation. Um, I don't think we need to go into much detail on it, but if you go into too many details, it gets too complicated, but just this much. We differentiate between a mind presently not being there, not presently being there, but the potential for the mind existing the potential of the mind existing. And then that potential can transform into the mind itself. That is called a seed that is not an imprint. An imprint, however, remains on the mind and it has different functions. It does not become a mind. It remains there in the form of an imprint until we attain Buddhahood. Then it is totally removed from the mind. Okay, now with this karmic seed, what happens, for instance, you can purify the karmic seed. You can remove the function of creating suffering, but the seed, it's the karmic seed, the imprint, the, imp the, the karmic seed that is an imprint, it remains. Okay, you only remove the imprints when you become a Buddha. That's the only time. So this will always remain an imprint always remain an imprint but its function changes the functions from being a negative imprint that potentially causes suffering you can remove that through purification all right but it still obstructs the mind it still obstructs the mind okay and then new ones come new ones come to it and they mix together it's not like they there are these imprints always they act and interact with one another they interact with one another so um, if you have, for instance, if you create a positive imprint, it can actually remove the negative one. Okay, so they can remove each other. It's a constant, it's constantly in, in, in motion. It's not like you have these imprints, but they still obstruct the mind as long as we have the misapprehension of reality. And as long as we haven't removed that and the imprints, we will, we have to remove them. Otherwise, we have to remove them from the mind. Okay. But so the basic function of these imprints is always to obstruct the mind, to keep it from being the old, becoming the all knowing mind of a Buddha. But until then, there's a lot of changes. Uh, as our mind changes, so our imprints change all the time. Old habits become new habits, etc. Because if that weren't the case, Buddhist practice is all about removing, that is, changing the habits the habits, older habits we have and replacing them with new ones. Does that make sense? 
right? So our mind changes because these imprints on our mind, though they're still imprints, we're, we still have the misapprehension of reality. And as long as we have that, we leave a residues left on the mind that keeps obstructing the mind. But the function of these obstructions, they can be altered in that we can change the function of a negative habit and make it and, and transform it into a positive habit. Does that, does that make sense? So, yeah, okay. So I'm getting into two complicated uh, um, ideas here, but hopefully that's a little bit clearer. It is very complicated, but just understand this. You have a mind and on top of the mind, it's not the only thing. There's always something left on the mind which influences our behavior, habits, and influencing the experiences we have. All right, another new message here from Varda. Is there a difference Different word in Sanskrit or Tibetan for imprint or seed, because in seedling sutra imprint is not mentioned. In the seedling, rice seedling sutra imprint is not mentioned. There are different words, as I'm aware of Tibetan. Yes, there are different words. Uh, Paksha is imprint and Saban is seed. Now, I need to look at the Tibetan version because I know I don't I remember definitely the word seed is used but I don't know whether the word pakcha is not used but the translator has not translated in that way so I would have to see the original one but you see in the rice seedling sutra the emphasis is less on on imprints because as I said the word is used in order to more refer to the cause the cause it leaves an imprint so something that is similar therefore it's in that sense, it's like a seed because it's just as the handprint is similar to the print in the snow, to the imprint in the snow. Similarly, um, something that accords with the anger, it leaves an imprint in the mind. But seed is more used to refer to potential, like something that it gives rise to in that form. So there's just a difference um, in terms of its function. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, therefore, in the Rice Seedling Sutra, it talks more, and we'll mention the Rice Seedling Sutras in this context anyway, uh, it makes more sense uh, to use the word seed to emphasize the, the, the potential it holds. Okay, now let's continue. Let's now move on to continue. What you've learned so far, hopefully uh, you've learned about how we end up from link number one ignorance we come to formative actions and you've noticed there's a lot in between you have attachment to the self and to that which is mine which is the self-cherishing or self-centered attitude you have attachment to other things you have other emotions and then of course you have karmic actions that's link number two giving Link number two, which is the formative actions, which are actions of body, speech, or mind, or actions that are positive, negative, or non or, or neither, uh, neutral. And those leave something on the mind, which is why the third link is consciousness. The consciousness is kind of like that which holds the seed. We want to know how the seed can survive, how this karmic seed, how this karmic imprint can remain with us for a long time and then eventually ripen into an experience. This is what we've, we learn about as part of the study of the 12 links. Now, I've taken a step further to understand the main aspects of the 12 links, I've now fasted forward and I went right away to link number eight and nine. And I'll say more about it. I just want you to get a general sense of the 12 links so for, to avoid certain confusions that always arise. Now, I said that this, this seed that is left on the mind only ripens when there are certain afflictive emotions that are strong enough to lead to its ripening because here of course the seed we're talking about the karmic seed we're talking about is one that potentially creates a rebirth in samsara and for that seed to ripen just as you have a seed like sitting like let's say you have a seed in a package it doesn't ripen the seed in a little bag doesn't ripen unless you have the cooperative conditions of water and warmth and certain fertilizers then the seeds start to germinate 
Similarly, with regard to this karmic seed left on the mind, for it to actually now ripen into an experience such as a rebirth, you need certain causes and conditions, and those are attachment and in particular grasping to the self. It's the wish to exist, in other words. It's this grasping at, I want to exist. And of course, this mind very powerfully rises at the moment of death when there's a feeling, I'm disappearing. And that then gives rise to the ripening of this particular seed. Okay, now, if you've understood this, um, just to give you this overall, before I go to then follow the order of the 12 links, I would like you to take a look at the picture of the wheel of life. The wheel of life. If you could just have it on the screen, could you it's part of the, the booklet I prepared. This was kindly um, made available from by Toshita to use here as part of this course and uh, explained, of course, also by Jadu Rinpoche. So if you look at this, this drawing here, okay, this picture, if we could see the center, if we could kind of go up a little bit, like, well, maybe make it smaller or scroll it up so that we can see the center. No, I can't do that from here. Can you see the center, all of you? Because I can't. Um, could we scroll it up a little further? Uh, still, I don't see the center of it. So, or maybe. Yes. Can you? No, I totally lost it. Yes, I had a, a internet crash. Uh, oh, that's okay, that's why. I see, I see. Okay. Now I can see a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay, so maybe. Yes, great. That, that's enough. That's enough. I think we can all recognize the center, the center of it. So you see three animals. Many of you are aware of what this means, but just as part of the explanation, you have three animals. You have a rooster, you have a pig, and you have a snake. Um, now, the snake, the snake uh, stands for anger. This, 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 the snake is symbolic of anger. The pig is symbolic of ignorance and the rooster is attachment. I believe I get it right. Yes, the pig. So you see the pig holds the tail of both the rooster and the snake. In other words, the pig is associated with ignorance, though that is totally, <laughs> I mean, why, why it's always... Pigs are, so, are considered to be really stupid, I guess, just because they we see them just eating all day long and it seems they've got nothing in their mind. I think people traditionally don't realize that a pig is very intelligent. Uh, but in terms of their, yeah, well, eating all day long, basically, whenever they get something, maybe that's why they're associated with ignorance. Anyway, it's this misapprehension, which is the here shown by the pig, holding the tail of the rooster and the tail of the snake, giving rise to attachment, and then thereafter giving rise to uh, anger. Now, why are those three, only those three, when there's so many different afflictive emotions? Well, they're seen to be the three root afflictive emotions. And actually, all the other afflictive emotions they are, they are in some way or another connected to one of those three. So if you think, for instance, arrogance. Arrogance is just an exaggerated version of attachment, being extremely full of one's own achievement, being terribly attached to them, and then feeling, having a sense of self-inflation because of one's achievements. So that's a form of attachment. Uh, jealousy or resentment, I've already mentioned, is a, it's also it's a form of both. It contains attachment, it contains uh, resentment. Um, other afflictive emotions such as afflictive doubt, when we're always doubting, always doubting, it's a form of a misapprehension. It's a form of, it's, it's, it's to do with ignorance, like never being able to decisively say it's like this or like that. 
and so forth. So all afflictive emotions in one way or another connect to those three. So that's that's the root ignorance. And then from the first link, the link of ignorance to the second link, formative actions. Well, here, the first link is really described in the center with ignorance giving rise to other afflictive emotions. And then karma, or formative actions, that is described in, with the second, with the first rim. So the center are the three animals and the first rim with the left side being white and the right side being black, where here this describes virtues and non-virtues karma here, formative actions, not just any odd karma, but the karma that throws us into a higher rebirth, a, a, a rebirth where potentially you experience more happiness, have more opportunities. That's the white, that's... Um, uh, described here by the white uh, part of the circle, kind of people moving upwards. And then the, the black side of the circle kind of moving downwards. So those are lower rebirth. And then the second room that describes um, the, the different realms of existence within samsara with the upper kind of left part. So if you have the watch, it would be 12 o'clock from eight o'clock to 12 o'clock to one o'clock. That part is, is the celestial realm. Um, the celestial, no, sorry. No, it's from 10 o'clock until one o'clock. So if you had a watch here, it'll be like from 10 to, to, to one. That's the celestial realm. Um, and then from one to, well, almost three o'clock, that's the human realm. The animal realm is kind of like 8 to 9.30, right? The, the animal realm. And then below that, you have the hellish realm with the different subdivisions and the preta realm. So the hellish realm is like from seven to 5 to 7 o'clock. And the preta realm is kind of tiny. It's kind of 3 2.30 to 4 o'clock or 4.30. Okay. Now, the realms. What is that? That seems like... Well, if you've left behind your own religion, which is a theistical religion, so one of the Abrahamic religions, it's almost like, oh no, the whole idea of heaven and hell and all that. Well, it, they exist to certain degrees in those religions and some more than in others, but it seems like, ah, oh, this fairy tale back to these different realms. And we have a really hard time when it comes to Buddhism about past and future lives and about the different realms. And I guess if we had to decide between these two, past and future lives and the realms, realms are worse. <laughs> the idea that we can be reborn in these different states, it's the harder to take on. Let's put it that way. Now, I want to say a little bit about that because, of course, we shouldn't take on anything. Let's not totally refuse to take it on like just be open be open-minded just to explore it further but we don't need to follow we shouldn't we shouldn't have faith in anything without analyzing it and of course i'm talking about it as if it were true but i also ask you to be skeptical and to analyze but i want to say a few things about this a little bit in order to take this as a possibility at least or maybe to get more of a sense of what this means Reincarnation, of course, very difficult for us. Why? Because we live in particular in a very materialistic world where we believe more into that which we can see than into that which is beyond our sense perception. And so past and future lives belong to that. And I like to challenge people why, when someone has a hard time with past and future lives, to analyze their own mind, to go into their own mind and check what is the cause for that? Where does that come from? Because in the end, we don't know either way. Is there past and future lives? I cannot prove the non-existence of past and future lives, but I cannot prove to you either, as in like, I cannot give you a proof that you can now use and based on that right away, understand that there are past and future lives. From a Buddhist point of view, there are proofs but these proofs are only effective if you have a certain kind of basic understanding and that needs to be developed. Now, what I can say is that since it's pretty equal, it could, there could be past and future lives or there could not be, allow the possibility at least to have an openness towards it. And of course, it doesn't harm to believe in future lives because that understanding of future lives 
comes along with an understanding that virtuous actions, ethical conduct is extremely important. Why? Because if there are future lives, their influence, they are determined, the quality of these future lives are determined by the virtuous actions or the non-virtuous actions we accumulate. In other words, our actions will have consequences in the future. This means if I take on the possibility of future lives and I do this in combination with an understanding of karma, because otherwise, what's the point? I would naturally, since I want to be happy, make an effort to create the karma, the causes to have happy experiences in the future based on this belief in past future life, lives. And so therefore, actually, it actually just benefits me. I would just live a more virtuous life. And if there are no future lives, well, never mind. So therefore, to live as if there were future lives is a win-win situation. In the end, I'll definitely live a more virtuous life. Okay, but let's just still explore the possibility that not only there are future lives, past lives anyway, forget about it. Who cares what was in the past? Some people are obsessed with past life regression and stuff. Like, who cares you were an Egyptian princess? You're not right now. Um, and so the past is past and the future is much more important. Now, what is more, more so, what's even harder to understand is that there are different realms of existence from a Buddhist point of view. The human realm, we're aware of. The animal realm, we're aware of. The rest, we're not aware of. And so therefore, we believe it doesn't exist. Now, that is not a very scientific approach, to be honest. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he was actually asked this question the other day, and somehow it got lost in translation. It was a, a while ago. I don't remember exactly when. When someone asked, said to His Holiness, Actually, what they did was they only translated the question. They didn't translate the comment. Um, His Holiness has the questions often written down. So someone said to His Holiness, His Holiness has said that there's a difference between realizing something doesn't exist and not realizing and, and not being able to find its existence. I repeat that. There's a difference between not finding the existence of something and realizing it's non-existent. Okay. So for instance, right now, I don't realize the existence of a virus around me. Let's say the coronavirus is all around me. Someone has just been in my room. Well, hasn't been, but even in case someone was, has been coughing you know, for a good half an hour and it's now left and the virus is all around me. Do I perceive the virus? No, I don't perceive the existence of the virus. Do I perceive the non-existence of the virus just because I don't perceive the existence of the virus? No, because the virus is here. I just don't perceive it. You see, there's a difference. Not perceiving the existence of something versus perceiving the non-existence of something. And we sometimes confuse those two. Because I don't perceive something, I believe it doesn't exist. And that's scientifically, I mean, well, a lot of people do that right now and then they get sick and they're surprised they get sick because they're like, oh, I don't get sick. I don't, right? There's almost like a sense, I'm not going to get sick. There's no sickness around me. But that is, that is just confusing those two. And the thing is, scientifically, there are a lot of things like 500 years ago, we had no idea of. Nowadays, we know of them. Um, Edward wrote something. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Very nice. He puts it really eloquently. Absence of ab evidence is not evidence of absence. That's exactly the same, the, the, the same idea, but said in a much nicer way. Okay. Um, great. So just remember what Edward said. Therefore, um, our idea of, for instance, well, the idea of karma, of rebirth, it's just something, well, let's assume it, I'll talk from a Buddhist point of view, we just cannot perceive it. And like, let's say 500 years ago, um, there were lots of things we didn't think, people didn't think were there. And nowadays they know they're there. I mean, other people, other people than those, but in, in, in general, humankind now knows that there are certain, certain things that previously they just didn't know that they were there and they thought weren't there because they couldn't perceive them. 
Now, I believe that scientifically it is possible to prove past and future lives. It's definitely possible to prove the existence of other realms, but scientists, the scientists, human scientists are limited in what they can perceive, right? What can you scientifically prove? Only something you can at least perceive, or you have a means to infer its existence. Right now, I don't think scientists have the tools to prove that there are for instance, other realms of existence. So therefore, it's just the sense, well, cannot see, it doesn't exist, belongs to the, to the religious aspect, and that is just blind faith anyway. No, just they put away with it. But actually, if you think a little closer, if you understand, I get a sense of emptiness. In the sense, understanding that our experiences are subjective, that each and everyone's, when we say reality, what is reality? Is there an objective world? I mean, science still, and it's moving away from that, but still seems to believe there's this, initially, it was very strong. 400 years ago, there was a sense, we will create this God view. We will see the things as God will see them, like everything, like the objective reality, like a bird flies over the world, and we see it as it is. But over the years, scientists have understood, well, the medium that we use to perceive things is the mind, and our mind is limited. Therefore, what we can see is limited. Now, based on that, nowadays, there's much more interest in the mind. If our mind is that which really perceives things, and if our mind is limited, of course, we only perceive a limited amount of things. And on top of that, the understanding that reality is just the summary of all our experiences. My experience, your experience, your experience, your experience, that is reality. Based on the Buddhist idea, there's no objective world because if there was, we should be able to find it. It should become clearer and clearer, but we just can't perceive it. Um, but, but there's no way we can't, well, there's we cannot perceive it as in like, there's my reality, there's your reality, and then there's no reason to believe there's some objective reality there. What would that be? What would that objective reality be? Therefore, the Buddhist idea that everything exists subjectively, and this can be established through reasoning. In a few words, I won't be able to describe this here now, but based on that, so therefore my experience well that is a i call it a human experience because although it is totally unique it is similar to certain other human beings but then there are animals and some of these animals i'm always fascinated in dharamsala when the dogs have their doggy thing going on you know at certain times they're fighting with each other and it's like a whole drama because we've got all these stray dogs walking around and I'm sometimes thinking, I live in totally my own world that is so different from a doggy's world. And there are these dogs like fighting with each other and doing their thing. And I'm thinking, how bizarre. I have no idea how they're thinking. They have no idea how I'm thinking. And we just live parallel here in like almost parallel universes. So why not there be other forms of existence? We just don't, you know, like, the, well, first there are viruses, there are whole clusters of viruses and they have their experiences right i mean very very limited those are very very limited of course if they are sentient at all i don't know but let's say they are sentient they have a mind there's a limited mental action that takes place at least survival this far so i'm not aware of their kind of experiences but then there are other types of experiences like i said experiences where there part of the mind of that person they're not an objective world they're hellish so they have nothing in common with what is human of course we talk about hell on earth but that is still hell on earth that is like a hellish experience you have as a human being but that's we can still perceive each other's body for instance because the body is such that my sense perception can be aware of it okay so then we talk of a hellish experience this person may have incredible suffering incredible hellish hellish suffering but nonetheless nonetheless that person oh my gosh oh gosh i need to stop well that was quick have a hellish experience and nonetheless um this person um 
the hellish experience. I'm not aware of that, but I would still call it human because we have certain features we can perceive. But then there are other states that describe where you have just total different experiences and you don't even perceive each other's bodies. There's nothing unusual about it. And those are described as hellish states. And then you have preta existences where, again, the body is of such a different um, quality that right now with our five senses anyway we cannot perceive it but even with machineries we haven't developed machinery enough or technical gadgets that allows us to perceive them maybe in the future we can maybe we can pick up on on preta beings on hellish being right now we cannot certainly not with our senses and that is still true for atoms and and viruses anyway our senses have not improved in that way it's just the gadgets that allow us to perceive them so that is the argument that's the argument i'm making um, and of course there are many accounts of great meditators in the past who taught us things who taught other people great greatly beneficial things that they could experience, they could utilize in their own life. And then at the same time, they perceived other states of existence and talked about them. Why would they lie to us about them? Why would they say that? You can still become liberated even without them. You can still attain enlightenment even without these hellish states. So if they didn't exist, why would they talk about them, make things so much more difficult? So these are just a few incentives that allow us to consider this possibility. Now I'm totally past the time. I'll stop here now. I didn't consider um, the time. We'll definitely do more meditation in the afternoon. Um, there won't be any question and answers. You can post them as before, um, but I want to go uh, do more meditation. And like I said, I'll do them in the afternoon and we'll take a break now for an hour. But let's, you need a bit more of time. Let's please, um, start at uh, five past two. Is that all right? Okay, so to give you enough time to eat and stuff. So five minutes after two, we'll, we'll, we'll start. All right, see you soon then. Okay, bye. In an hour and five minutes. No, in, in exactly an hour, we'll meet.